Hi, Jessica. You're muted, by the way. Oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry, Emily is muted. Okay, sorry. Oh. Hi, it's nice to meet you. How are you doing today? Good, Jessica. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. My name is Jessica. And um, for those of you who don't know who Tony Bancroft is, he is not only the director of Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves, you've also worked on the 1998 Mulan and as well as Animal Crackers. And to keep going, you've also worked on The Emperor's New Groove with Kronk and Aladdin with Iago, The Lion King with Pumbaa. It just keeps going. You've done so much amazing work already. I'm it's been a long life. You're basically just calling me old. No, <laughs> it's, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen all these films. And then you also have the newer film coming out with Space Jam's A New Legacy that you. Yeah. Oh, and, you got the title right, too. Most people say Space Jam 2, but it is Space Jam, A New Legacy. Yes. But, I mean, I, I just love, I love animation. I love telling stories through animation. It's, it's largely... Um, well, it's largely been my life, but I, I love it. I just, I just really enjoy it. I've never get tired of it. And so Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves was just really an, an extension of going, okay, it's not a big, you know, studio picture. It's a smaller independent, but I really want to be a part of this because I believed in the story and the, and the theme of the movie, which is exceptional. Yeah. And I mean, going back with all of your other film history, did you draw any inspiration from your past films to help bring this film to life? Or was this just a separate thing? Well, I mean, they're all new and different in their own way, but uh, certainly my experience over the last several years, really the last 10 years, but even directing Mulan gave me a lot more understanding of working with actors because I recorded, you know, Eddie Murphy and, um, just all uh, Ming-Na Wen and all those actors originally from uh, the original Mulan. Um, and I've, I've developed a better technique of understanding actors, what their needs are in the room when you're recording them for voiceover, because it's very different from recording, you know, an actor in live action. They're in costume, they're in, in an environment, in a scene. They can kind of get in that headspace a lot easier. But when they're in a room by themselves, they're usually not recording with other actors. Then, then you really got to feed them a lot, give them a lot of information about what's going on. I read against the, the actors too, so they can get a tone and a pace and understanding of the movement of the scene. Um, and that really helps them to be able to find that character and create that performance. I actually saw some of the behind the scenes when they had released it on Disney Channel. And I saw the behind the scenes as well when Christina Aguilera was recording the song. And so- oh, Mulan, yeah, yeah. 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 That. <laughs> and so your films seem to feature these characters who have to dig deep in themselves where there there's work to grow where in this film they're overcoming these body image issues and also work on their ego um what do you hope that people will take away from this film well i mean yeah you really said it is it is about uh, the theme of it is about who you are on the inside as opposed to who you are on the outside. It's not about looks, but it's about heart and character. And um, I love that. As a father of three daughters myself that are now adults, it was something that we talked a lot about when they were young. And, um, and there's still a lot of issues with that in our society, in our world. And I think this, this film bravely takes on, in a fun way, believe it or not, but it, it bravely takes on this idea of how, you know, how do we see ourselves and what truly matters in life uh, about who we are? Um, and in that regard, I think it's going to be a very impactful film. The, the, the theme will really resonate with families. So I'm hoping that families really get behind this as a way of not only having an enjoyable, fun time watching Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves and, and the journey of these, these funny characters and the mission that they're on and all that, but also, you know, take something away with it, whether it might be discussions afterwards um, with parents and children. Um, my, I watched it with my seven-year-old Isun, and she could not stop giggling. There were so many modern jokes in there. Um, did you have a favorite joke out of the whole film? Um, I mean, I, I really love the um, you got Merlin line that, you know, Merlin says on a continual basis. And then we kind of change that at the end where it's like uh, there's a serious you got Merlin moment, you know, um, where, where Snow and Mer I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but they fall in love. Um, so yeah, I think that was an ongoing bit that we had a lot of fun with. 
Yeah, that was he's like that doesn't sound right if you don't say it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were, we, and then she was giggling over when not to get a spoiler, but when they were going over the water with the broom and all that happening, she just could not stop giggling. It was. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <laughs> and so, as the director and animated creator, what was your favorite scene or aspect of the film to, that you made? Like. What was your favorite thing to have made through the film? I mean, I, you know, I love I love when an animated film is justifiably animated, you know, that it's a choice to make this. It's the best way to tell a story is through animation. And I think Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarfs is an example of that because there's a lot of, we do a lot of playing with the curse that's on the dwarfs where they look like, you know, these ugly little green guys. But then if you're somebody that sees them that you could see them as the princes and the humans that they once were. And same thing with Snow White, when she puts on the red shoes, there's a whole magical element where you see her as a princess and then other times where she's her regular self. And, and just playing with those visuals made it so much fun to animate and to create little scenes with that were larger than life. So I, I love that animation like this, you know, relies on a certain kind of fantasy and and magic to it that, that can make it larger than life and fantastic for the audience. Yeah, and the, well, I don't wanna give away the spoiler on that part, okay, I'll just leave that up. Oh. <laughs> and I heard a familiar voice with the magic mirror. He uh -huh. So played Kronk on the Emperor's New Groove. How was it to work with him again? Oh, I love Patrick. And um, not only as a performer, obviously, cause he gives great comedy and he's, he just always hits it. He adds a lot of warmth to his character. Um, so when the, you know, I was talking with the directors and the producers early on about uh, casting for the Magic Mirror, they had some suggestions and I said, oh, I got the right person. Here's the person, Patrick Warburton. And, and uh, I've worked with Patrick now for like four different movies or different projects here and there. Um, and I would love to continue to work with him on future projects because I just think he just, he just lands those characters so well. He's, I just love him. He's in so many things that I've seen. I just, I know that voice. I know. Yeah, you just know. Oh, that's Patrick. Yeah. Right. That's all of my questions for now. Thank you for joining me and talking to me about this. Thank you, Jessica. I enjoyed it. Take care. You too. Bye.